And, and what did the federal government give the railroads? Land and basically free money. Because no interest loan, that's, you don't have to pay for the loan. You know, if you go buy a house and get a mortgage, you pay for that money by, by paying the interest. So what a good bargain for. Them. And so where are we at then? We got pump direct point, we got the land grant. Oh. oh. You'll drop it, you'll hurt somebody. No, I won't hurt you. <laughs> I'll save it when you're not ready. It's more fun that way. So we're going to jump right to, we're not going to talk about that. The railroads would spell the end for the Plains Indians and the conquest of the Plains for the United States. The second industrial revolution did that. That is obviously a very stylized painting of that. But the 30 million bison herd would be split in two by the transcontinental and then cut up from there. And it'd be the railroads that would bring in the buffalo hunters, would supply the troops. It was the railroads that ended this. And so with that, let's get to very quickly, we can't go into great detail about all the Plains Wars, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the final destruction of what of this culture that's going to live here. But remember, we talk about the Plains Indians. After Tippy Canoe and Horseshoe Bend, but especially Tippy Canoe, American Indians were doomed for taking the land. The United States was going to take all that land. And so what we're talking about here is really a tragic glass stand. The Plains Indians were significantly different than the Eastern tribes. They were nomadic, they were hunters. I always put buffalo, I know it's technically bison, but you know. And before I get to the Fort Laramie Treaty, because they're nomadic, by definition, their bands are going to be very small population that's got to be controlled. Not, a common, not only a combination of movement, but there's a shortage of food. Yeah, sure, there's bison, but there's rain. And so there's not going to be very many. And one of the things, the Plains Indians fought each other, and within the tribes themselves, there'll be different bands that conflicted. And so you can imagine what the American policy is going to be about the various tribes. So, in 1851, the Fort Laramie Treaty, Fort Laramie is one of the few permanent forts on the plains, right here. It's on the North Platte River in Wyoming. It's pretty much rebuilt. It's, it's a pretty cool place. I like going to places like that, so I always do that. But, 1851, it basically said that the plains will be for the, the tribes there. As long as they allow the United States to come in. So that blob there is approximately where the plains are. And the whole idea was is that people can get over this as quickly as possible get to California. And the U.S. can build forts, but then it divvied up the areas that the Plains Indians would have, but it was pretty vague. Both, well, almost every tribe broke it. The United States broke the treaty, but there's a heck of a lot more people from the U.S. and the tribes. So when the U.S. broke it, it's a lot bigger deal. And there's going to be a lot of fighting. You know, the Lakota Sioux and the Crow fought continuously. The Lakota uh, being pretty bad. And so there are going to be fights like that. But all of this would break down. We already mentioned mining. We have the railroad coming. But even before the first railroad, the first transcontinentals, because of the mining, oh, we're going to get right to 1864. I'm going to pick a couple fights that will personify the nature of this battle because it was pretty well, by definition, it's going to be one-sided. Sand Creek's in Colorado. And what it was is they have all these buffalo hunters going out to the plains of Colorado and were destroying the buffalo herds to be the miners. Soon to be the southern herd. In fact, even for the railroad got there, it's going to be cutting a hole into this area. Has anyone ever like driven across here? It's flat, as flat can be. And then you can see this like black mass coming at you, the mountains. It's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of startling almost. Because those mountains, that's that wall right there. Well, the Cheyenne, other tribes through their ally, the Arapaho, the Kiowa, but the Cheyenne with the biggies there, they begin to fight back against the buffalo hunters. And actually, they were pretty restrained, but still, 
they started killing a few of the buffalo hunters, trying to keep keep people out of their buffalo hunting ground. And they could do the math. And this is 1864. It's during the Civil War. The United States is fighting where Indian territory, most of the tribes are joined the Confederacy. It's pretty close. They saw this as a potential threat, not only because of the um, they wanted the mining for, because of the war, but also because of the Civil War. Militia in Denver, pretty well armed with some regular forces under Colonel Charles Chivington, went out to find the Cheyenne. They eventually found a band that, remember I told you the tribe, the, the English and the U.S. would always try to pick one band to be the leader, even though it was a heck of a lot more complex than that. So this is called Black Kettle's Band. And they were what they called peace Indians or treaty Indians. They agreed not to kill buffalo hunters. It was mostly for that very few men of fighting age. Black Kettle's teepee flew an American flag. And the problem was this. As Shimington went out, they could not find any of the other Cheyenne. Part of the problem was, even though they wanted to campaign in the winter, if the weather was relatively good, the U.S. could never really U.S. forces could never really grapple with these Plains Indians because they would just disappear. In fact, they would try to attack in the winter when they're hunkered down in one spot for the winter and do a surprise attack. That would be the United States strategy. And so when Shimington found Black Kettle's band, it was like, well, Cheyenne, close enough. And so he ordered an attack. And that is a painting of it, but they swept in without warning. Well, actually, there was warning. The Cheyenne knew they were there, but never dreamed they would attack. They're flying an American flag. And they just assumed that's our symbol. We're not part of the groups that are attacking the Buffalo Hunters. So they swept in, and it's good. Even though you're going to see this marker here, it's called the Sand Creek Battleground. It was the massacre of Sand Creek. They killed over 10, over 200 men, women, and children. And these are very tiny bands. The only thing that saved a lot of the of the Cheyenne and Black Kettle's band, including Black Kettle, this time at least, is Shimington and his men had were so drunk, they could hardly fight. That's the only thing that saved them. In fact, when Shivington was asked before the attack, should we kill children? And he responded with the now famous phrase, nits make lice. So kill them all. You know what a nit is? Lice is. So this would in many ways personify the battle before the railroad got there. And for the next five years, the Southern Cheyenne, they'll soon be known, are going to be absolutely devastated, just destroyed. And they're going to be divided because you're going to get a lot of tribes like Black Kettle's like, we can't fight these people. And they would actually help defeat the more warlike, uh, they call them non treaty Cheyenne or dog soldiers, too. In this area down here, Black Kettle's band would probably be killed on the Washita, attacked without warning again, happened twice. The next time be the Civil War hero and glory hunters, second in command of the 7th Cavalry, George Custer would attack him there on the Washita. That's how Black Kettle would die. But this kind of personified the fight even before the railroads got there because it ties in with the Buffalo, ties in with it's soon to be the railroad. I got to pick and choose. So I'm not going to talk about the Apache or the Modocs or the Utes. I'm just pick a few. But. The U.S. tactic then after the Civil War became one that they've been doing for a long time, divide and conquer. The U.S. used the Crows to beat the Lakota and then turned and betrayed the Crows. Now when I say Lakota, it's a Lakota suit. And... Wait, so by divide and conquer, does that mean they like, split up the other yeah. and then... So they. Yeah, they would help one tribe against another tribe, or help one group within a tribe. And the problem was, you think about for the various tribes, you have the nomadic, got their whole families there, from the very young to the very old, and they got to defend them. And yeah, the, the Plains Indians were amazing on horseback, incredible fighters, but very individual. They basically fought with their own rules, where the U.S., the United States Army and Cavalry, where their army, infantry and cavalry, relatively disciplined, organized, follow one command, huge disadvantage for them. Individual combat, yeah, but as a, trying to defend your family, you're not as disciplined, it's a real problem. And part B, 
then concentrate them on and soon to be called reservations. You remember they already did that with Indian territory here? Okay. They would eventually get only about a, a fifth of this land. Concentrate. And those would be called treaty Indians. Sometimes res later on reservation, but treaty. And the idea was, okay, go on the reservation and we, the United States government will care for you as payment for giving up your land. And how long would they care? Forever. Forever was supposed to be what it was, but define care. What does that mean? For, for, I'm going to care for you by allowing you to farm this land. Good luck. Well, that's, wasn't a lot of, like the middlemen who were supposed to. We'll get to it. The BIA, Indian agents, yeah. You're, <laughs> we're getting to that, yeah. And total war. The non reservation or non treaty Indians that refused to go to the reservation, that tried to maintain their way of life, they would be run down with total war. The same people who won the Civil War would be in command here. Heck, think about it after the war. You have President Grant, the commander of the Army is General Sherman, and the commander of the Department of the Missouri is General Sheridan. All those guys I mentioned in the Civil War, and they knew one way to fight. And if you're going to kill off the Plains Indians, the total war, starve them, force them to totally submit and go to the reservations, what do you kill? Get rid of the bison. Kill the bison. Kill them all. And won't that open it up for farming and ranching and civilization? And that would be the justify. The justify. The bison can't be can't be domesticated, so let's get rid of them. And so, still can't be, can't domesticate bison. If you don't believe me, go pat one. <laughs> they ranch them, but they're not domesticated like cows. Trust me. <laughs> and so, I put this up here because once you get this across here and then the other tracks <laughs> or the other rails would come in, it just crisscross along there, right along that line, then the buffalo would scatter and it would make it so much easier to divide and conquer this land. And so, with that, even as the transcontinental was being built, you still have mines. One more war we gotta talk about really quick. Oh, I almost forgot the buffalo hunters. One more thing, when the buffalo hunters came in, they would get a pelt. That's all they would do. One man, one team of buffalo hunters, you know, four men, with a shooter, uh, two skinners, and a cook. And they could kill a thousand buffalo a day. And what would they do? They might cut their tongue out, they thought that was good eating, and then skin them. And let the rest of it just sit flat. Sometimes they would just kill them and let the whole thing rot. But the skin would give them something. They would skin them, scrape it, lay it flat, and you get these bundles. They'd literally bale it like hay bales. Get these big bales of it. And they would send them back east. And what did they use them for? They're really valuable. Too heavy. I mean, you could use them in really cold, but blankets. The leather was so thick that they would use the belts for the new factories because it wouldn't break. That's what they used it for. Factories for the belts and the bottles. Didn't have rubber, didn't have, and didn't have the process to make the strong enough canvas to do it. Yeah. And so there they are. And then the southern herd was basically destroyed by 1870. The northern herd by the mid 1870s. The last area you hear in Montana, this area, 1878, 1879. By the mid 1880s, there were less than 2,000 bison left alive. In fact, the real first wave of what we say today is environmentalism, environmentalism, but it's conservationism, was about how to save bison and kill them all. It's a miracle that there's any left. That and trees, they about cut down all the trees, about 90% of the original forest. Were cut down. So like, we got to conserve these. Conservation is different than you think environmentalism. Conserving is to use the labor. We'll talk more about that when we get there. But 
Then the bones, another kind of hunting would happen. They went and they scraped up all the bones. Here's one of the more famous pictures. Yes, that's real. That's in the eastern plain, or western plains of Kansas. <laughs> Didn't have a camera. That's all buffalo hair. And they scoured the plains for every buffalo bone, got them on train, sent them east, what they used them for. Hmm? Rounded up in fertilizer. Bone meal fertilizer. It's great fertilizer. So it's almost impossible to find any buffalo bones on the plains. You figure after the millions of, of the those who died, you'd find some, but no, they scooped everything up. That picture is absolutely unbelievable, isn't it? It's when you think that's that's a painting, but it's real. I wonder how many ducks down there. Hmm? Would you yeah, I know. Getting down would be a mess of those horns. Yeah, I know. Slide down like so. One of the but the Lakota. Now I wanted to tie a few things in the Montana, so I just picked there. Even as the the transcontinental railroads are being built. The Bozeman Trail would connect the Oregon Trail up into the mining fields of Montana. And the Lakota Sioux, along with Cheyenne, that went right through their prime hunting ground. And this blatantly violated the Treaty of uh, Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851. So the Lakota and one of their leading warrior chiefs, is called uh, Red Cloud, even though he's getting quite older, is Red Cloud. And they were to cut off the Bozeman Trail, even though the U.S. Army built three forts along the trail. And two years of fighting in the really cold northern Wyoming, southern Montana winter, is where they did a lot of the fighting, they cut it off. And the reason I mention this is, first off, it's a victory in a war, not just a battle, a victory. They cut off the trail, but it was a very hollow victory. They would sign the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, but in that treaty, Red Cloud, and he kind of knew, we can't do this again. They agreed to go on a reservation. Now, the reservation had all kinds of caveats. They could leave the reservation, but once they agreed to go on a reservation, down the road, the U.S. would say, no, you can't. So this was actually a pretty hollow victory, and they just found a different way. This way, eventually, the railroad here to get food up into the miners. And so, has anyone been to that part? It, it's the Fort Phil Carney is really an interesting place. Very pretty along the eastern slopes of the Bay Lawrence. Yeah, really pretty area. And I was there one summer, ah, over thirty years ago. Wow! But it's amazing how time flies. I'll never forget this driving along. And there was a road, and it was covered with grasshoppers. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was you could not see the road. And so we're driving along, and it sounded like pop Because mm -hmm. all the grasshoppers were jumping up and hitting the, the bottom of the car. I'll never forget that. And you could see the trail of your, yeah, it was. <laughs> and, you, and you tried to stop? Yeah, it was. Yeah, they, they have people that actually got yeah. bad accidents. It's so slippery and they just grasshoppers. And had to, had to, yeah, there were grasshoppers in every thing, every part of that car and the hood. Why? Huh? Why? Oh, yeah, Co totally covered. Why? We had to get rid of the window shades. Okay, the windscreen. So, here's the reservation it's huge. And then all this area in yellow was the area where they could go hunt buffalo every summer. But a lot of them were non treaty. Lakota and Cheyenne, and they just stayed out there the whole time hunting. So you can imagine how they wanted to get rid of those buffalo. And this would be the treaty. The Black Hills were here. For the Cheyenne, it was a very religious place. For the Lakota, they were more pragmatic. By the trees, the new trees. But the Black Hills was theirs too. And they did surround with a few forts. But we're coming up to let me the, right one, the Great Sioux War. 1875 to 1877, most of this was part of Montana. And I, I don't have time to go into all the details of it. It's a pretty amazing thing to happen, especially since you know, I grew up in that area, so I have all these areas. But in 1874, the U.S. Army did an expedition into the Black Hills. 
because there were a lot of prospectors violating the treaty going in the Black Hills. And it was actually an element of the 7th Cavalry under its second in command, George Custer, the Civil War hero. And they said that there was gold in the Black Hills. And what did that trigger? Gold rush. All these people came to the Black Hills violating the treaty, and the U.S. did nothing to keep them out. And the Lakota decided, how was it? We're leaving. And at first, hundreds, but then thousands joined these non treaty And then when the U.S. Army said, all right, all of you have to go back, they said, no, we're staying. And by the summer of 1876, there were between five and 8,000 Lakota and Cheyenne. If you know anything about nomadic tribes, that's a lot of people. And they have to be pretty separated. But in the summer, they started kind of unifying. And what happened is the U.S. Army decided, this is what President Grant said, okay, we're going to force them all back. They also want to build a railroad, the great North, the Northern Pacific right through here. So men from Bismarck, North Dakota, from Bozeman, and up from Fort Laramie, we're going to surround them right here in the drainage of the Yellowstone River. And it would be here that cavalry sent to find this band would stumble into one of the biggest bands ever, ever on the high plains. And what battle, of course, am I getting to? The Battle of Little Big Horn. Has anyone been to the battlefield? A few people? My dad was a really story about that. It was raining when you were in the trap line, right? And the army was walking the trap line, and it was raining, cold, so cold. Half the temperature, giant hay piles, piled in one of the hay, hay piles. My dad was driving along and saw the trap line, and didn't know where he was, and came piling out of one of the hay piles of the battlefield. He just came screaming into the car. It's a funny story. It's really funny. But yeah, it's on the battlefield. Right there on the ground, yeah. It gets cold out there. Yeah. 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 Gotta be tough. Did you see what the temperature was in eastern Montana? Yeah, Jordan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. What? Just wait for it. It's like that here. No. Uh, we're well, Bismarck is always cold. It's between two or three million below. <laughs> well, the Battle of Big Horn is on a little tributary of the Big Horn River and June 25th, 1876. And the 7th Cavalry, it was under probably, you know, it was the person they wanted, they assumed would find this band, even though he was the second in command, Lieutenant Colonel George Custer. There's Custer right there. And Custer's cavalry were going to go find it, and what they found was a band. They assumed God, it's going to be big, maybe a thousand, and it was probably seven thousand. But Custer assumed, as they always thought, if they see us, they're gone. So they attacked. And at the bay, our two Lakota that were there, and Hump, Hump, and then they go, Hump Papa, Lakota, Sitting Bull. Who was getting fairly old, and he was more of a religious leader, even though he had been a, a great warrior. He spent his whole life trying to resist the expansion of the United States. He's very much a realist. There's Sitting Bull right there. And another Lakota, Ogallala, named Crazy Horse. We don't know what Crazy Horse looked like. They asked, but he never would allow his picture to be taken. Why do you want to steal my shadow, he would always say. Which is a good question. Because how do you answer that? <laughs> and the thing about it is, remember I told you, you know, they fought very individualistic, but certain people like Crazy Horse were such dynamic warriors that they would follow him. But it still was pretty disorganized. And Custer divided his forces into four parts, with the assumption is I gotta, you know, make sure they don't run away. And the approximately 220 men with him that were going to ride into the camp and actually take probably the men and women hostage. I think that, that appears to be their plan. They never made it. And all would be men. All would be killed that would attack. But over 240 of the cavalry, but maybe 40% died at the Battle of Little Bighorn. That is a picture of take, by one of the Lakota 20 years afterwards. I think that's a pretty interesting picture. And that's Custer's, it's, um, uh, Custer's Hill, you can go there, that's where his mime is, where they just put the stone, um, they put the graves where the men died. 
the most of the, most of the uh, Shine or Sioux who died, they were taken off, but there was a few markers there. And pretty well preserved. And Ezra Bush would make these series of posters as advertisement and put them in bars all over the country. Custer's Last Fight soon became Custer's Last Stand, and that's how people knew about it. One of the most successful advertising gimmicks in history. For Budweiser, I always find that kind of fascinating. And there's a few bars that still have these, some of the really old ones. And so, those are some of the bones from the battlefield. It took a couple days for the rest of the army to get there. By then, the Lakota and the Cheyenne had gone. And so when they got there, think about it, they have to go, so they're going up the Yellowstone, then they go up the Bighorn, up the Little Bighorn, got the word, they had to go back up, up, jump on a steamboat, eventually made back to Bismarck where there was a telegraph line. Then it went back to the rest of the United States. So the battle's on the 25th. Anybody want to guess what day it finally got back to the rest of the United States? It got into the newspapers. July 4th. July 4th. Oh. This humiliating defeat hit the papers right during the centennial celebration. And that is when General Grant, and this is the big thing is about the Sioux War, that is when he ordered, the U.S. Army is very small, but more recruitment, and destroyed the Lakota. Destroyed the Shaka. Was that like the Indians, but like the Indians, yeah, they beat the Seventh Cavalry, but it would be their end. Because after that, the United States will not let the Lakota stay on the plains. They are going to be totally destroyed. They built forts all across East on Montana, North Dakota, Wyoming. The hem the tribes in and ran them down group by group all the rest of the summer. But the big thing is for winter of seventy six seventy seven. City boat fled up into uh, or Canada for a while, then came back a couple years later. Crazy Horse would finally surrender in Nebraska, and in the process, he would be murdered. Hmm? There's a, yeah, and there's a monument being built, uh, even you know, where Mount Rushmore is, the Crazy Horse, and yeah, I, when the first time I went to the Mount Rushmore, it was just a mountain, but now, I mean, it's, you can see it's, you can see a face, even though they're kind of guessing what he looked like, and it's huge. Who's been there? A few people? Pretty. Yeah, I always have mixed feelings about carving up a mountain, but it is still pretty spectacular to see it. So with that, the Sioux would be absolutely destroyed. And all would be forced back on the reservations, and Every single one must go on the reservations. Remember how big the reservation was? This is how big it would they are now. They lost about two thirds of that land, and those are the reservations today. Pine Ridge now is even smaller. This part is here. It's now owned by somebody else. But the reservations, now this is, will be their land they can live in. And one more thing I have to talk about very quickly. In 1877, the Nez Pierce, who lived right here, the Nez Pierce, they Without them, the Lewis Clark expedition, the Corps of Discovery, could never have made it. They, by tree, were to live in this area of the Willamette Valley. And the U.S. ordered them now. They pretty much got rid of the treaties and ordered them to another reservation here. This is for the southern band of the Nez Pierce. And in the conflict over this, it's not clear who fired first, but the Nez Pierce, basically they're going to be moved by the U.S. Army after that, and they took off one. And there's only a couple hundred, less than a hundred men of fighting age. And Chief Joseph, who's right here, and he was actually more of a political leader and kind of a spokesperson, so he got the, he, he gets a lot of credit, and I like that picture. I think partially because of that picture was taken before the Pompadour haircut. That was a, the religion, had, he had to wear this haircut like that, I think of a 1950s uh, musician or a rock star or something. But they started, Running across Idaho, and the decision was made to go up to Canada to join Sitting Bull. And they would end up going 1,500 miles, defeating U.S. Army forces two or three times bigger. And that's very were pretty potent. And including right south of Missoula, the best known battle was Big Hole Battle. And they even went back into Idaho across the brand new Yellowstone National Park, where they got in a little conflict with a couple of the tourists. Couple died. They fled, beat off a force um, from Cork Keel right there, 
but then went maybe all the way up to here and then bang, exhausted they stopped if they would have kept going they might have made it to canada i don't know what would happen then but the u.s army surrounded them there they surrounded 1500 miles hmm? the bear paw mountains that's actually really it's really you know you got this flat 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 pretty neat mountains and then just then the you can see the curvature of the earth and so actually they were from Fort Keogh that was put in those forts after the Battle of Bighorn the commander there was a Colonel Nelson Miles so the little town there was Milestown so it became Miles City and I grew up in that town so we'll interrupt the connection named after a Civil War hero and then that general and the Bureau of Indian Affairs would not go to run these reservations and by 1890 Virtually every American Indian now was forced on a reservation. The Apaches, some of them, some bands of Apaches continued to fight into 1890, but they would be totally destroyed. And the reservations are a heck of a lot smaller. And the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs. Were they the ones that forced them onto the reservation? No, they're the ones who ran the reservation. The U.S. Army forced them. And Indian agents back then, they're not called that today for a lot of reasons, but Indian agents would run individual reservations. And, well, what a great way to steal money from the U.S. government. The government would provide money to pay for food for the reservations. And what would they do? Just pocket it. Buy substandard food or not even buy food at all. And just get rich. Or they would buy spoiled or rotten meat from a, a contractor who's a friend, they overpay for the spoiled meat and then get money under the table. The Indian agent would for giving them a good deal. Anybody know what that money under the table is called? Have you ever heard the term kickback? That's what kickback is. So you get a contract and give you money back. Yes, they're all making money. We suffered. You can imagine by the 1880s, these reservations were just absolutely destroyed. So many had died. There were about 225,000 American Indians left. It was just unbelievable. And so you think about this of desperation, of pain that had to be on the reservations. Heck of a lot more had family members amongst the dead than the living by then. That is why one of the most tragic religions you could imagine would come out of this. The ghost dance religion. The ghost dance started in 1887, but really became huge in 1889. Wovoka, who's right here, Wovoka was a Paiute. And so we're talking the Paiutes, we're down here. He was also educated in a missionary school, so he combined a little bit of his religion, his Paiute religion, along with a, with a Christian kind of Protestant religion, so you combine the two. And what he said was, in this ghost dance, and the ghost was an important part, that if you, at first start out with, if you did this dance long enough, believe Jesus would come. Remember, it's a combination. Jesus would come. And with Jesus, so the whites would leave, the buffalo would return. And your ancestors who died would return thus to ghosts. And you know, that desperate something. And it spread like wildfire. By the time it got to the northern plains with the Lakota, it was a pretty it got it went from being more we just kind of have our land back to, well, wear this ghost dance shirt, dance long enough, hard enough. Not only will all those things happen, but if the army tries to stop them, bullets will bounce off your ghost and shirt. The dirt will cover and kill them all. Now, Sitting Bull, who's right there, put another picture. He had returned. He also did for a, a short stint on the Buffalo, Buffalo Bills Wild West show and toured around reenacting various events, including the Battle of Little Bighorn. Very curious little thing. Sitting Bull's an interesting guy. And he, did, he wanted to go see what the United States was, and he hated them, but it's still scary. Sitting Bull, now he's in northern South Dakota, and Sitting Bull has decided, okay, I don't know if I believe this or not, but boy, is this making the Indian agents scared. 
So let's keep doing it. And by the end of 1889, Indian agents in the Lakota reservations were convinced that this was going to lead to another uprising. They're going to hit the road again. This is patently ridiculous by 1890. It's almost a lie. I mean, they can't do it. But U.S. Army troops begin to surround the reservations again. And in 1890, they decide to arrest City Hall. You may know what happened to City Hall. Right? In the process, now you're shot. And this was the pan. You can just imagine, oh my God, they're going to kill us all. And so a band under this guy right here, half chief, they're up here in the Shine River and they took off towards the Pine Ridge. So it just started, we're talking January 1890. They started going to another reservation, thinking that we're all going to be killed. Unified. There are some ghost stands, even though it was actually dying by January 1890. The U.S. Army ran them down. It was the 7th Cavalry. They were calling themselves by then Custer's Avengers. And they ran them down on Wounded Knee Creek. Now, originally it was relatively peaceful, but they were going to make them go back to the reservation. It's really kind of confusing who fired first, but a battle started and the battle turned into a massacre. Over 200 Lakota were killed, men, women, and children. In fact, it became just kind of almost like a killing frenzy. And this time, they had weapons that, they had a weapon that Custer turned down because it would slow down his march. They had Gatling guns. And Gatling guns would fire about 200 rounds a minute. They also had high, fast firing uh, small cannon called Hotchkiss Cannon. It was a massacre. It was called the Battle of Wounded Knee, seen as a great victory by the United States, but in reality, it was a massacre. It was kind of the symbolic end, a very important symbol, symbolic part of the, uh, of the Lakota. Two days later, they went back to bury it, and the bodies were frozen. Just laying there frozen solid, because it was over 30 below zero. And that's half chief. He died just like that. He was shot in the belly. He died, froze, completely froze solid right there. And. 1970s, when a, a group called the American Indian Movement, we'll get to it again, but when they were desperately trying to fight for whites on the reservation, it'd be Wounded Knee, which is right about here, this is where they would try to hold out, they would try to fight for the rights right there. So Wounded Knee is a very important symbolic area. But after this, the fighting is over. But actually, Wounded Knee is it's really, it's a pretty area. And it makes it even more it's tragic in that way. I've been there once and it's really interesting. But now, think about the United States. Here's the US. They're thinking, okay, now we force them on the reservations. Now what? We gotta make them into white farmers. Civilize them. Now let's be very clear about something. By what I just said, it's doomed for failure, isn't it? Not only because of the logic of dry farming the high plains, no irrigation, just farm. You want to go to the Helena Valley and start farming? What are you going to grow? No, no irrigation. Rocks, rocks, dirt grows really well. Same brush, and they're not white. So the whole premise is ridiculous. They're still going to have the issue of racism that would be underlying everything, but. We should tell you about where they're actually. So-called do good. Oh, and this became the same. And so they would, the beginning of educating and turn them into white. There's also another one was beat the Indian out of them. That was another pretty common thing. Because they're savages. The only chance they have is we have to beat them until they finally realize they can't be savages. And so the first thing is to turn them into white farmers. So people who have never farmed before, we're going to say, here, farm. And what they did is, it's called the Dawes Severity Act. It's also called the Dawes Act. This is 1887. I forgot the year. I forgot to put the year. What is it? 1887. And what they're going to do is this. Remember, as a tribe, they're the tribe. They'll have this, um, they're on the reservation. They'll be cared for. If... They convince families or individual males to give up their tribal membership 
they'll get a homestead in the reservation. Do you remember how big a homestead was in the Homestead Act? Yeah, which is tiny on the Great Plains. They'll get a homestead. In 20 years, it's theirs, and they'll be farmers. A lot took the deal. Well, some didn't make it. But then the rest of the land on reservations then, they decided, okay, it's just being wasted. We'll open it up for everybody else. And this is going to trigger a massive land rush for land on reservation land. That's where you get this sign right here. This is actually from Oklahoma in 1900. A land rush. And open up to non-reservation members, meaning whom? White people. And they came in and bought it. Oklahoma was going to be almost all for Indians. They opened up almost 90% of that. And they had this one of the last big land rushes where they literally just said, okay, go. And people came in, like, put a little flag or marker and just claim land. In fact, that's where the nickname for the state came from. Because if you want to come in, you better get your land sooner than later. That's Oklahoma Sooners. Oklahoma, that's where Sooner comes from. But they ran it, took the lamb, and today. Oh, one more thing I almost forgot. We need agents. They would see the land, they knew, okay, why is he going to want this land? And so they took off, they took the land with water. Good ear or good bottom land that's you know we have a floodplain, and they wouldn't let Indians get that on the Zaws Act. They would save it and give it to whites, and they could get a kickback. Today, right now, over half of all land on reservations are owned by non-reservation members. Seventy percent of the land on the Flathead Reservation near Kalispell owned by people who are not members of that tribe. Anybody want to guess what that's going to do to the tribe? Do you want to know why the poverty rate on reservations is 15%? I just told you. The Dawes Act was a disaster. It crushed the tribes. Oh, I'll just put this up here. And then for the kids, you got to beat the Indian out of them. So, the Burke Act will create tri tribal schools where they will have to give up everything of their own culture. Anyone have heard of these? Yeah. Um, my grandpa was famous, like, famous, and famous, and famous, and famous. Of course, yeah. And if he didn't, they would. Yeah, well, I'll tell you a little bit more of the bell ring. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me one bit. Did you miss something? Oh um, yeah, so there's a white kid and white They were very segregated white teachers. Actually, huh? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I was going to say you say that. It was a big one. I was like, how did you get the mountain that was a little bit off? Yeah, I don't know what they call it. Still, it was, it was, I just think it's really funny because he was on the battlefield. He was in the battlefield on one of the giant main stacks. Oh, that's why. Yeah. He was like in the main stack. Right? Well, I What is 